everyone, and welcome to the, the, the 34th Anfarin Conference. Uh, this is a wonderful location, and I hope you have been enjoying connecting with your colleagues and, um, and being energized and being inspired as we begin our new semester here. I am incredibly uh, grateful that we can hold space here uh, to be in community with all of you, uh, both in person, but also online as well. So thank you. Uh, all of you for joining us this afternoon. Um, this event, of course, um, is made possible by the hard work of a number of folks, including many of you who have taken up the challenge to uh, develop and offer and facilitate many of the wonderful sessions that we are we have been holding since yesterday and also later this afternoon. I am extremely also very grateful for the CTRL team and the faculty fellows whose creativity and expertise and energy are boundless. Uh, the work of the AV team, uh, facilities, catering, uh, all the work that is necessary to make uh, this event as smooth and as um, productive and fun for all of you. Uh, I also want to recognize Monica Jackson for all the support that she provides for CTRL and uh, my team. A quick plug for CTRL. I know that AFC is the single largest event that we hold. We have about 450, maybe 60 registered for this event alone, which is pretty large. Um, but there's a lot more that we do throughout the year, which I, I'm sure many of you know. During this past semester alone, that is from August to December, we held 55 events, which were attended by more than 2,100 of you um, on, on topics ranging from a crash course on R uh, to the hidden curriculum and a racial equity kickoff for leaders. And so really a broad range of topics, which I think have been invaluable for uh, all of you and, and for the institution at large. And I, I think this level of engagement uh, speaks very clearly to our commitment uh, to the scholar teacher ideal, to our students, but also uh, to one another. And so I appreciate all of the work that all of us, all of you are doing uh, to make this institution what it is. And so thank you, all of you. Um, and, and I hope to see more of you uh, more often in the upcoming semester. And so it is now my pleasure uh, to invite Peter Starr to the podium to launch, uh, or, uh, to, to launch the plenary. Peter. Thanks, Keo. And let me just say that I too, and I think all of us are grateful for the work that you and the entire uh, CTRL team do uh, to prepare for and launch in this outstanding conference. It's really a highlight, a milestone in our academic year. Uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge a friend and former uh, provost, interim provost, Ann Farron, the namesake of this conference. Who's been so important to the way we think about teaching and learning. Uh, it's a real pleasure just to come together as a community of scholars and teachers every the beginning of every spring semester to celebrate this important work that we do. At the moment, it, however, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my, my boss, uh, our president, <laughs> Sylvia Burwell, um, friend and boss, uh, Sylvia Burwell. As you know, Sylvia is AU's 15th president and the first woman to serve in that role. Under her leadership, and these are just two of many, many firsts, AU became the first carbon neutral university in the United States and the first to launch an anti-racist research and policy center. Sylvia has helped lead AU to become a leading student-centered research university, more than doubling our research funding from external organizations. And we're getting to the point where we're now tripling and quadrupling. So we're, <laughs> we, got some, <laughs> we got some really good news on that. Uh, thanks to Diana Burley and the entire faculty of this university, uh, and helping to build a growing community of change makers who are both bold leaders, engaged scholars, innovators, and active citizens. Sylvia led the university through a historic pandemic, always keeping the focus on our community of care. She spearheaded the creation of AU's comprehensive campaign, Change Makers for a Changing World led the launch of our $500 million Change Can't Wait campaign, and was the animating force among many, including Amanda Taylor here, of our plan for inclusive excellence, which aims to ensure that all AU students thrive and reach their full potential. Before coming to AU, President Burwell, that did 
very small job, Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Director of the Office of Management and Budgets. She's also held very high-level leadership positions at two of the greatest foundations of the world, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Walmart Foundation. Please join me in welcoming President Sylvia Burwell. Peter, thank you um, for that introduction, but also thank you so much for um, your leadership and support of our faculty, but our entire uh, EU community. Peter, thank you. And Kehoe, to you and the team, uh, I, I just a huge thank you uh, in terms of what it takes. As you mentioned, there you are, Kehoe, um, in terms of what it takes, the CTRL team, but all the other pieces and parts and folks that have contributed to this, the Ann Farron Conference, with which Ann continues to be, I think, a highlight of our new year. And it's an engaging and invigorating way, I think, for all of us to kind of come back and, and get this semester um, started and to be reminded on a consistent basis of why we're here, you know, to empower our students to be those change makers to the world today, to create that knowledge, to innovate, to create creative product uh, that many of you all do that change the world. So it's a, it's a wonderful way to do that. Um, and so, Anne, a huge thank you to you for a vision 34 years ago, as Kehoe mentioned, um, that this would be something that would be uh, so important to our community. So a thank you to you and to all our faculty and staff um, that are here today. And for everybody joining by Zoom, saying hello to the people by Zoom, um, I hope that everybody was able to take a little bit of time these past few weeks with friends, with family, uh, in terms of, of that time that we had. And this holiday season, as I'm sure many of you know, for many reasons, isn't without challenges. This one presented new challenges, I think, to all of us. I didn't know that the words bomb cyclone would be part of the vernacular um, for 2023 as we kind of enter that. And I myself, um, fortunately, was one of the last flights into Seattle as that ice storm um, hit there. I was not flying southwest, though, um, which uh, was fortunate as well. And so I hope that each of you during that season had a little bit of an opportunity to celebrate and cherish the things that give you joy. And, you know, when I think about you know, we're back. There's the things that gave us joy over that break. But the AU community and all that it does is actually something that brings me joy and that I feel privileged and grateful to be a part of. And whether it's greeting students when I walk to work or cheering on our best in city men's basketball team this year, for those of you who don't know, um, or watching you all work your magic in classrooms or hearing about the research uh, in scholarship that you do, I'm inspired uh, by our incredible community. So I wanna preface uh, my remarks a little bit with, I am not a classicist. That's not really news to most of you. Um, and I'm gonna admit it's a little daunting because we do have some scholars in that space in the room, but I'm going to claim my Greek heritage as I launch into these remarks. And so I'd like to spend a few moments before we have our plenary and our panel on uh, talking about the Delphic Oracle. And for those of you who read my other memo, you had a little bit of a, a spoiler alert about that. And so located on the mount, on the slopes of Mount Parnassus, for those of you who may have been there, um, is a beautiful view of the Corinthian Gulf. And that is where the Delphic Oracle, which was one of the most famous oracles of ancient Greek history, actually resided uh, in terms of there's a temple there, and that's the Temple of Apollo, and that's where um, the Delphic Oracle was. And the Delphic Oracle played an important role in the development of Western civilization. I do have to put in parentheses here that it is true that my father did say every word came from Greek, for those of you who have seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. So, and carved in the pediment at the um, Temple of Apollo in Delphi is the maxim, me then agan in Greek. And what that means is nothing in excess. And I know you're wondering where is this going and when are we going to get to the retention um, panel. But I'm hoping that this intro and this connection is going to help you not forget um, uh, this particular set of remarks that I deliver at the Anne Farron Conference. So nothing in an excess. 
Those wise words, I believe, must guide our way forward as we build a strong, cohesive, vibrant AU community. As a university, we often focus on the individual. We talk about your degree. We talk about your research. We talk about your change making. When we recruit, we look for students. We look for staff. We look for faculty who have the passions to act and change the world. And we know that this is actually all part of our differentiation. It's part of the secret sauce that makes AU the place that it is. Individuals who are committed to making the world a better place. But individuals who are not joined in community don't get the impact that they seek. So today I wanna to posit that we need to heed the Delphic Oracle, nothing in excess. So focusing exceedingly on the individual at the expense of the collective, the we, is not where we should be. So whether that's, if you think about it in terms of we need Ubuntu, a phrase that we've used and talked about actually in our convocation, I am because we are. Or another phrase that we've sometimes used and talked about is to go fast, go alone, to go far, go together. So we must focus on the we. And what that means for our mission, for our change making, for our happiness, and for our joy. And many of you have heard me say that for AU, community is both a means and an end. It's a how and a what for us. We need community, the how, to do what we want to do. It's at the core, actually, when you stop and think about it, of how universities actually work. Community is the underpinning of shared governance. Engaging with one another, living our values and our commitment to our students and our research collaboratively, that's how we grow stronger. That's how we build a sense of belonging and purpose. And that's how we become deeper change makers. Community is also a place where we all find support, where acceptance and learning happens, where it's a place where actually we can all find our superpowers and they can come to life when you're in community, where you can achieve the impact that you seek, a place where change makers are part of a change making community. And building this community is actually a we effort. It's something that we can and we must build together. And that's what got me thinking about the Delphic Oracle today here at the Ann Farron Conference, which is the largest gathering actually of our faculty community as Kehoe just mentioned, in terms of we're here, we're at the beginning of the year, it's this large ga gathering. Because what's the vision of this conference? And I was fortunate to spend just a second with Ann um, before we get to see each other annually face to face <laughs> is, is how this sometimes works. But what makes it such an important annual tradition is the idea of convening together to become better, better colleagues, better teachers, better students, better scholars, and better at enjoying the work that we actually do every day. Because when it comes down to it, it really is about the joy we spark, the change making that we inspire, and the community that we build together. As you all launch, and we launch into this next part of the day, we're getting to the panel. You see, I brought us there. We're back. Um, I hope that you're going to keep this idea of community in mind. This theme for this year's conference, and as we're focusing on these issues of student retention and thriving, it's connected to community. We know that if our students feel like don't feel like they belong at AU, then they aren't going to stay. And we also know that the decision to stay and graduate comes from countless interactions with this community, which means that every one of us actually has a role to play. You, our faculty and our staff are vital in this effort. You are engaging with the students every single day. And the relationships that you build with the students are core to advancing our mission. So we all want our students to succeed. We all want them to go out and change the world. And we all want to build an AU community that supports and challenges them and us to be our best selves. So over the past years, we have made progress. We emerged from the challenges of the pandemic stronger. And we did this, if you think about it, how we worked together during those challenging times, supporting each other as we faced unprecedented challenges 
coming together as one AU. And we focused on our mission, as well as the three pillars of our change maker strategy. Those pillars, learning, scholarship, community. And we continue to strengthen our reputation as a, a place in so many ways, whether it's a top place for experiential learning, whether it's a place where students in our School of Communication win a Pulitzer Prize, whether it's a place, as Peter just mentioned, where we've been able to double our externally funded research. I can go on and on, but I will not, um, so we can get to our panel. But instead, I actually want to just close with a heartfelt thank you. You, our faculty and our staff, are at the heart of what we do and how we do it. And we've kept our momentum because of you, and we met the challenges together because of you. And I know that we're going to continue to do that, both in terms of our momentum and when challenges come our way here at AU. So I actually want to close. I'm going to close with another Greek word, which is afaristo. Thank you. Sylvia evoked briefly some of the indices of the momentum that we have as a university, and they are real and they are very important. And I will say just personally, it's a great pleasure for me to serve as a, your provost uh, during this time, this wonderfully transformational time for this university, which I have come to love over the 13 years that I've been here. Um, back when I had scholarship, <laughs> some of you may know, uh, my scholarship focused on the cultural production in the wake of great political and social upheaval. And it's a truism of this work that the hardest times are often not the moment of upheaval itself, but its aftermath. I trust that might sound familiar. As faculty, you've not only had to navigate the sudden transition to online education, that was hard. You've also had to negotiate changing academic expectations on the part of our students, and yes, on kick from time to time on the part of their parents. Rising levels of anxiety and stress across our community, not just among our students, and an ever decreasing, increasing global distrust of our most important institutions, including the institutions of higher education. These have not been easy times. But as Sylvia's reflected, the power of the AU community is strong, far more so in my experience, and I think in the experience of those of us who spent, like you, Joe Andrew Taylor, who spent time at other institutions, the power of the AU community is exceptionally strong. At the time of the RISE project, that some of you may recall, whose principles are now firmly embedded in our Change Makers for a Changing World strategic plan, our recently retired colleague, Sharon Alston, who many of you know, often spoke of the janitor at Elon, do you remember the story? Who would say he was there to support the university students and to ensure their success. It wasn't he was there to clean the restrooms. He was there to support the students and ensure their success. Helping our students on a path to successful graduation at American University, in other words, is job one for all of us. Let me be clear on this point, though. Supporting our students does not mean, and this is an issue for faculty these days, we're very conscious of this, catering to their every whim. To piggyback on Seth Gershenson's really terrific discussion yesterday and the importance of setting high expectations for teaching effectiveness, it's our responsibility as teachers and mentors to craft developmentally appropriate curricula that challenge our students to thrive in their disciplines, their chosen discipline or disciplines, and as citizens of the world, as change makers for the changing world. What supporting our students does mean is ensuring, and this is CTRL's mission writ large, ensuring that our pedagogy is both challenging and responsible, and reforming those processes and procedures that may hinder our students and our success. Above all, it means realizing the ambition of today's panel to ensure that each and every AU student, both undergraduate and graduate, comes to feel that they fully belong in our classrooms, in, our, in their academic program, in their school and college, on the AU campus, and in the American university community as a whole. This is our common mandate and one that perhaps more than any other 
will help us to realize our great ambitions for this university as a student-centered research university, of which Sylvia has so nicely spoken. So with that, I'm conscious of the old saw about how a dean and a provost or a president is always the person who keeps you from, stands between you and lunch. You've eaten lunch. The real lunch is coming. It's the panel. And so let me get straight to the introductions of the panel. I'll just say just a couple words about each of our panelists who are going to contribute to what promises to be a vibrant discussion. Yeah, they come from a variety of different perspectives at this university who are going to, and their groups thus such are going to bring interesting perspectives and diversity of perspectives to the conversation. Amanda Taylor, who is moderating this afternoon's panel, serves as AU's Assistant Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In that role, she animates campus wide collaborations that advance the university's inclusive excellence goals. Prior to that, Amanda spent seven years as a full time faculty member and master's program director in the School of International Service, where she still teaches. Her research and teaching focus on anti-racist educational policy and practice. Our first panelist right here in red is Corbin Campbell, Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Associate Professor in the School of Education. Corbin's research interests include college teaching in diverse institutional contexts, assessments of higher education quality, and the organizational environments that help faculty to thrive in their careers. Prior to joining AU in 2019, it seems like much, she's made such an impact here and it's only been three, four years. Corbin served as associate professor in the higher and post-secondary education program at Columbia's Teachers College. To Lisa Carter, assistant professor in SPA's Department of Justice, Law and Criminology joins us today. Delisa's research examines theoretical explanations of accountability and the role of identity in the critical justice system, as well as the impact of colorism on criminal justice outcomes. She is an affiliate scholar at the Urban Institute at Brookings and at George Mason Center for Advancing Correctional Excellence, and her work has been funded by both the NIH and the NSF. Noemi Ashatagui de Jesus is a senior professorial lecturer in the Department of Psychology and my old stomping grounds, the College of Arts and Sciences. Woo. Noemi currently serves, as many of you know, as the faculty director of the Community Based Research Scholars Program, one of AU's outstanding first year living experiences, living and learning communities. Her research focuses on the stressors that impact Black and Latinx women, youth, and families, with a particular focus on immigrants. Also here today is Tom Cohn, Executive of Residence in COGA's Department of Management. <laughs> Tom te teaches courses in entrepreneurship and strategy and serves as experiential coordinator for COGA's online immersions and MBA, executive education and undergraduate capstone co courses among many other roles. I could have gone on for everybody's so CV for a very long time that you don't want that. Prior to joining COGA, Tom was a two-time CEO and had a successful career in business and media. And finally, our final panelist from the Washington College of Law is Brandon Weiss, professor of law. Brandon's research and teaching focus on property law and theory, as well as on the relationship between housing, economic mobility, and government intervention. Before joining AU, Brandon represented tenants and community-based uh, nonprofits in Los Angeles as a Skadden Fellow and has taught law at UCLA, Yale, and the University of Missouri at Kansas City. I want to please join me in thanking all our panelists for joining us today. And I'll turn the floor over to Amanda. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm sorry. I said good afternoon. Thank you. Um, now, Peter called this panel lunch. I'm going to call this panel dessert because it is such a treat and a delight to be a part of this conversation of folks who know what it means to make a student feel seen. 
And at the end of the day, I was just talking to my, my good colleague and my big boss, Fanta Av, before I came down here. And she said, you know, we have all these academic and intellectual definitions for what belonging means, right? This idea of mattering, being cared about, being connected. And there's a whole higher ed literature, which Corbin and others know very well about this and why it matters. But at the end of the day, it's that feeling of being seen, right? In all of who you are not having to fake anything, but an authentic connection and recognition, right? And I think personally, it's an honor to be here with this group, but also in this group of folks who have over my career here at AU you've helped me feel a sense of belonging at this place and continue to push me and all of us, I think, to continue to do that better and more effectively for all of our students who we know don't have equal access to opportunities to feel a sense of belonging, given the structures and cultures of higher education, right, especially in a predominantly white institution. So it is an honor to be here. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and we've got about five questions for our panel. Um, and you know, various groups of folks have, um, you know, raised their hand to speak on different questions, but along the way, um, I know Kehoe and the team will be collecting questions, right, from the audience as well as from the Zoom audience. So please, you know, as a question comes up for you, as you have a thought along the way, make a little note um, because we're looking forward to having this discussion, but then a good Q&A that follows. So to start us off, everyone, um, let's just set the baseline. Like, how are your students doing? You know, from your perspectives and your classrooms and your mentoring and all the different communities where you live and work, how are your students doing in terms of their engagement, in terms of their thriving, in terms of their sense of belonging? And how has that varied? So if I could start, Noemi, do you wanna kick us off? Do you mind? Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see all of you. Um, so how are our students doing? From my vintage point, I think we have a lot of students thriving, which is uh, very comforting, very heartening to see. But we also see some students that are overwhelmed. So those are the two camps in which I would put this. Um, and I would say that the students that seem to be thriving are those that are making meaningful connections, right? And with whom are they making those connections or with what are they making connections? Um, so in the program, for instance, that I am the faculty director for the Community-Based Research Scholars Program, CBRS, just throwing those letters out there so you become familiar with that. In the CBRS program, for instance, we see the students connecting with each other, which is the basis, right, for how they start to feel that sense of belonging. Um, but we also try to see how can we create spaces, create time for them to have those connections. And we can do that through um, the activities we have with them, of course, uh, opportunities for them to engage. And so a word, a phrase that we've been hearing a lot is experiential learning. So we're trying to see how can we use experiential learning as a way for students to feel that sense of connection, of engagement, and then that idea that they're thriving. And the way I see that they're thriving, the reason I think they're thriving is because what I see them saying is how they are seeing their future as they are engaging in these different experiences, they are seeing like a light bulb going off of, wow, this is how I can have an impact. They're seeing how um, it makes a difference when you um, put yourself out there. And um, so for those students who are doing that and, and feeling that they mean something, right? They mean something for others. They mean something for their peers, for, for their communities, uh, for the DC community at large, where we're doing these experiential uh, opportunities. So that's one way of seeing the thriving, because we see them um, thinking of their future, thinking of how all these pieces build on each other for what is possible. Those that are overwhelmed, on the other hand, I think are some students that are trying to see where, where is it that they can connect? What is it that will be meaningful for them, that it means something for their own personal experiences and history? Um, and so the ones that are overwhelmed, are overwhelmed for many reasons. That's one possibility that they're not necessarily connecting yet. 
um, with things that mean something to them. Um, but they're also overwhelmed because they're, I think Peter mentioned this earlier, um, there's a lot of mental health and physical health challenges that our students are dealing with or that we ourselves may be dealing with. And so some students are struggling with that. And you see that not only on challenges personal to them, but their, their families or their loved ones. And so I think, Amanda, you mentioned something a moment ago about being heard or being seen. And I want to uh, point to that as well. So when we try to engage with students, right, to, to, to hear them or see them, we need to acknowledge that, right? Those, those, that circle, that, that life that they bring with them that is making them feel overwhelmed and sometimes fatigue. There's a fatigue um, that also is going on among some of our students. So I'm sorry to go on that downward uh, spiral for a moment, but we do have a lot of thriving, which is great to know and see uh, in our students. Thank you, really important points, I appreciate it. Tom, you wanna weigh in here? What are you seeing sure. and noticing? Sure, um, I'm from the dark side, co-god. Um, so um, yeah, I guess I'm a glasses half full sort of guy, but I I'm seeing some serious issues in our classrooms. Um, you know, I've never seen students wear their earbuds in class uh, like they do regularly, crazy. Um, so many students, I've been teaching eight years now, never seen so many students literally just not do their homework, not even intending on doing their homework. Um, and, you know, you have it in your syllabus that you can't use phones and, you know, you could be standing right next to a student and they're on their phone and they don't care. Um, I mean, you know, one of my favorite authors, uh, David Foster Wallace, always talks, always talked about um, that internal monologue that we always have going on in our heads. And, um, you know, when you're sitting at home uh, on Zoom doing classes for two years, uh, that internal monologue is going, you know, hyperspeed. And, uh, and that's all you have. You have your head and you have inside your phone and your computer. And, um, and then they come back into the classroom. And my sense is that they still feel like they're on Zoom, even though they're physically there in your classroom. Uh, they're multitasking, um, and my self, fail safe method. Uh, I, you know, went to business school where uh, they use the Socratic method and the case study method exclusively. So I bring that into my classrooms. I do not lecture. Uh, it's all conversation, all Socratic method. So friendly cold calls, and um, I, that used to be my way of you know snapping students out of it if they're. If I see them smiling and laughing on their computer, I'm not that funny. So I know they're not paying attention. So they're pretty easy target for a cold call. Um, and, uh, but that has not, even, even that has not done the trick. Um, so I sort of, I've talked about this with my other co-god professors. I mean, it's like a giant tsunami just coming over us and we're trying to all find ways to uh, combat it. And, you know, I think it's gonna take time for them to, recover after being that long uh, inside their own heads and their computers. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So Brandon, what are you noticing in the Washington College of Law? Like, are you seeing similar patterns? Are things distinct? Um, you know, how, how's this lining up for you? Yeah, so first, I just want to say thanks so much for having me here. Uh, sometimes feels like being on a satellite, being up at the WCL campus. So really nice to be here with you all and privileged to share the stage with everyone. Um, and you have to forgive me, I'm a lawyer by training, I mistook the assignment, I briefed the case, so I'm going to rely on some notes. Uh, leave, leave it to a lawyer to show up with a folder and print it out, brief of the case of how students are doing. Um, but I, I would agree with much of what has been said. Um, I think that, yeah, to Noemi's point, many, many students at the law school are thriving. If you come visit us there, and I hope you will at some point, campus is buzzing with activity, not just thriving in the classroom, but across all the different dimensions of the student experience, the journals and clerkships and moot court and socially. Um, so I agree with, with what you said about that. Uh, and to your point, Tom, I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said that I don't encounter a number of students uh, who are really struggling. Um, and I think that's become you know more pervasive post pandemic. 
Uh, I started at AU uh, in the fall of 2020, so really right as the pandemic was getting going. Uh, and among other courses, courses, I teach housing law and policy, which is the area I've practiced in. It's what I research and write about. Uh, and I started to notice a pattern in office hours early on into the pandemic of students showing up who really had no interest in talking about abstract issues of federal housing policy. Uh, they wanted to talk about their own housing challenges. Um, they were being evicted. They couldn't pay rent. They were being harassed by their landlord. Many of them had moved home to live with family in the Midwest or elsewhere to save money, uh, you know, raising other challenges for them. So, you know, I tried to mostly just listen, offer some advice, support where I could, but it was mostly just, you know, replacing higher flute and academic conversations with, with listening sessions. Uh, another pattern that I noticed was, as has been said, uh, a real increase in students willing to talk about having, you know, anxiety and depression uh, or feeling isolated on campus. Um, and from my vantage point right now, I think sort of where we are uh, is we're through the worst of that period. That's sort of the pulse I get at the law school, but certainly not really out of the woods. Um, I regularly get students, we've already started at the law school. Some of the, the lead up to this conference was as we enter into the semester, we've been going for a week at the law school. Uh, and you know, I have a number of students already requesting accommodations. Um, in more so than in previous years, not just around physical ability or disabilities, but around mental health, uh, students talking about anxiety and depression, uh, migraines, feeling dizzy, elevated heart rate, brain fog, these sorts of things, uh, asking for more time to complete assignments, maybe wanting not to do certain assignments, like make a presentation uh, to the whole class. So I think it raises some interesting questions it's definitely a minority of students uh, for sure, but clearly I think they probably represent a much larger number of students who are maybe just sort of soldiering through more quietly, meeting the deadlines, but struggling on their own. Uh, so it's something I'm trying to, to figure out and muddle through. How do we support students who are raising their hand and saying they need help? How do we help students who aren't raising their hand? How do we reach out to them and make sure that they know that there's help? Uh, and then also, you know, how do we assess and evaluate in this context where um, students have, you know, varying capacities right now? So I know we'll be talking more about that. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's also helpful. You've laid out, you know, how what we're seeing show up in individual students is really a reflection of so many layers and layers, right, of complexity and context, right? And we're, we're all embedded in networks and relationships and context. And it's a lot, it's a lot to do all at once. So, you know, we're wondering to the panel, what is the role of faculty in this process, right, in particular? And, and, it, and you know, students are not alone in dealing with all of these challenges. How do faculty in, in working to support and help this important thing stay attuned to their own wellness, right, and their own health and their own uh, multiple um, goals professionally and personally in their lives? So um, maybe I'll turn it first to, to Corbin and then to Talisa after that. Corbin, what do you think? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate on this panel, and uh, thank you to um, Ann Farron for starting this amazing conference, and uh, to CTRL for hosting this for 34 years. It's just such a pleasure to be a part of a university that takes teaching seriously and um, has a long record of doing so. And I think that connects to this question deeply. Um, because, so uh, my field is uh, the field of higher education. So I study colleges and universities. And there, so some people know this, but others don't. There is a robust field of scholars whose entire work um, focuses on colleges and universities and ways to support student success. And in fact, there is a, and yes, we have one of those incredible experts as a part of CTRL and the School of Education, Dr. Brian McGowan, right here in front of us. And, um, and so we have wonderful resources here um, to access that literature base and that research. But connecting to this question, um, I will say that there is a volume called How College Affects Students that pulls together all of the research that has been done since the 1960s to look at what are the outcomes of college and what are the things that matter most in the college environment that influence student success. And in that volume, one of the most critical factors 
in student success is the faculty. So I just wanna reiterate that you all matter so deeply to each student's experience, and that's on the individual level, but also to the way there is a community of care at, at American University that students feel in the environment, they feel in the norms. Um, and so much of that centers around you. We're gonna talk about teaching later, but in terms of the role of the faculty, um, we know that that faculty-student relationship matters so much to student success. And um, it matters both to their retention, to their graduation, but also other outcomes that you all, I know, care deeply about. It matters to student leadership. We know that having a faculty mentor, for example, um, students who say that they have a faculty mentor are more likely to be student leaders. That connects to community, right? That connects to student community. Um, we know that, that faculty have an influence on students' um, ultimate understanding of dem democratic outcomes, for example, their civil, civic engagement. So even beyond retention and beyond their graduation, it also matters to who they are becoming as individuals. And so I want to thank you for partnering in that important endeavor. All right. So one, super excited to be here. Um, I also, um, unlike Corbin, I'm a criminologist. So I study criminals, crime, and deviance. Um, and <laughs> it's quite fun, honestly. Um, also race, which in 2020 made it a little, little dicey, well, always, but. Um, I will say that um, I asked for this question to be included because as someone pre-tenure, trying to publish, trying to figure out, you know, how I show up in space, trying to figure out politics in my department and my school on campus more broadly, it almost felt criminal to ask anyone of, of us or anybody in my position to also consider retention. But the truth is that we're already playing a role whether or not we accept it, <laughs> right? It, retention is embedded in what we do, similar to inclusion, similar to belonging, whether or not you take it up as a subject matter expert, right? Similar to race and racism, you can't get away from playing a part in retention. I also ask for this question because I'm a first generation black woman who went to an Ivy League college, you pin up the road, predominantly white, considerably less black, um, there when I went than it is here now. And I never had a faculty mentor, never. So I go to the town halls and um, Provost Starr gave the statistics about how important faculty mentorship is. And I'm like, dag, <laughs> where, where, where was Talisa's mentor? <laughs> the truth of the matter is that though, um, even if you don't accept it on as a subject matter ex area, right? You're not an expert in it, right? You have a role. Right, um, and whether or not you experienced it yourself, right? I can tell you from personal experience being on AU's campus since 2018, we're mentors by default. Mentorship happens in moments, right? And I think for someone also that doesn't have children yet, you might look at mentorship like, wow, I have to take people on. I don't know names, I'm so bad at names. So to be a mentor to a group of people and then to also say, um, you play a significant part in them remaining, right, and belonging on American University's campus, that can be super overwhelming, right, for someone pre I'm going to talk for me, for Talisa, pre-tenure. Um, and so it seems overwhelming, but we're doing it anyway. And so I really um, want to advocate for this kind of stance that even though I couldn't identify a particular faculty mentor when I, my undergraduate experience, um, it happened in moments. It happened quickly in office hours. It happened when someone looked me in my face when I asked a challenging question and didn't dismiss it. it. It happened when something racially charged happened in this country and it came up in class and I wasn't the person that had to answer the question. That's when mentorship happens, right? It doesn't always mean that you're assigned to me and you're in my lab and you're publishing a paper with me. It happens in the hallway where even though I don't remember their name, I looked them in their face and I asked them good morning. And so I'm advocating, um, and I think my contribution to this panel as someone who's trying to earn tenure and figure it out is, <laughs> is that mentorship doesn't necessarily mean another burden to the load. It's something we're doing already. And it's something that honestly, similar to inclusion and belonging and um, kind of race, racially, um, the race data is that if you're just generally a good person, things will happen like this anyway. 
Thank you so much. Speaking so much truth here. And I think let's say one more, let's add one more layer before we move on, which is as we talk about faculty, I think we should expand our frame and talk about educators, right? And in, in, in my mind, and I think we know this to be true in the literature as well, right, Corbin, is all of us are educators, right, at, at a university. Staff are crucial, right, in this piece. Um, administrators, right, all of our facilities, everyone who works here at this institution is an educator, right? So whether we're formal faculty in classrooms or, or whether we're teaching in other ways and spaces and places across the institution, we are all a part of this and that those same kinds of um, outcomes and interactions and mentorship moments are also um, distributed across this organization and taken up by folks across this place, um, even if they're not in formal roles like faculty. So I just wanna name that as well. Um, so we've talked a lot, we've laid the context here, y'all. We've laid, you know, what's going on, do we think? Um, what is our responsibility? Um, and how do, we, how do we start to do this? But let's drill down a little and start to say, what's worked for you, right? In, in your own practice, and I would say praxis for those of you who are the educators out there, free areas, right? It's action reflection, right? Critical action and reflection. So what's, what's worked for you to create some of these meaningful interactions? Um, with your students, some of these moments that, that Talisa talked about, um, whether they've been between students and faculty, students and peers, right, staff and students, how have you approached this? Um, alternatively, if you wanna talk about what you tried and what didn't work, that's good too, right? Because we're all works in progress, right? If we're being authentic with our students, we need to be authentic with ourselves. None of us are perfect at this. So either what, what have you tried and you've seen some progress or what have you tried and um, you learn from it and you're not gonna try it again. So. Let's start with, um, with Tom. Okay. Um, so since we're the statistics people, just to give you a few statistics, um, I guess the uh, across all schools at AU, the retention rate in the first year is 85 to 90%. And in the second year, it goes down to 77 to 82%. Um, not so good. Um, and according to uh, Dean Evans, who I spoke with this morning, she said the number one reason students leave, and I guess this potentially is COGUT, I don't know how it, uh, how it, it if it uh, is across all the schools, but they, they're not sure about, to new, use another business term, they're not sure of the ROI, return on investment, they're not sure um, if they're getting their money's worth, it's an expensive school. Um, and then secondly, you know, they're not, you know, finding their people, potentially. Um, and to also go out to the, the business world, uh, we've all, all heard the phrase, the great resignation, um, and there are a lot of articles about that out there, as you know, and, and the articles that I'm reading on that talk about how finally um, employers are spending a little bit more time uh, on retention. They actually are asking their employees, like, how do you like it here? And how can we make it better? And it used to be, eh, you know, if you leave, you leave. If you don't, you don't. In fact, Zappos, you may not know this. Um, I talk about this in my classes. Um, in the first week of a new employee's uh, tenure at Zappos, they offer you a thousand dollars to leave, um, and thinking that you know someone staying at the company where it's not a good fit is is not good for everybody. So we'll pay a thousand bucks to leave. Um, not recommending that here, by the way. Um, Did you try that in your class? And what happened? Not, no. Not, I'm going to take a note on that. Um, but on the um, one thing we do do, um, and Casey Evans mentioned this to me, in the sixth week at COGOD, we do a survey across all of our students and ask them how they're doing. And if there is a, uh, you know, a flight risk, um, then Casey will talk to them and a, and a professor and another administrator will also get in touch with them. Um, and, you know, I, another thing I also see in the papers these days is these, I don't know why there's so many these days, uh, happiness studies, um, you know, what makes people happy, you know, my 89 year old mom or, and younger people as well. And again, we've all said it, it's uh, connection and relationships. And so, um, uh, Dean, uh, Dean Marchick, our new Dean sent out an email recently and he said, here are a few things that as professors, we cannot be responsible for. Um, this is more the uh, faculty, uh, the administ administrators here at AU. You know, does a student like his or her roommate? Um, is it easy to enroll in classes? Do they have a good college advisor? Uh, as a professor, those are not my things. 
but what things I can be responsible for, um, do I inspire them to learn? Um, and things like, is my curriculum up to date? Um, or am I just teaching stuff from that I taught 10 years ago? Uh, so, you know, that's, that's important. Um, I mean, I, I do pride myself on, um, getting to know my students. I have them do a, a PowerPoint, uh, on their own optional, uh, about themselves at the start of the semester to talk, you know, show me pictures of your pets, show me pictures of your hobbies, uh, help me get to know you because, um, I'm sure in all the fields, but in business, it's all about networking. That's what LinkedIn is all about. And um, so I'm like, hey, I could help you get a job someday, or you could find somebody else in the class that's from Michigan or also wants to be a broadcaster or whatever. Um, you know, let's let's get to know each other here uh, and talking more about just uh, classroom stuff, um, you know, going to their sporting event, um, finding out what their favorite music is, um, you know, just almost becoming a friend with them, I guess, in some ways. Um, so I think, um, again, I just think it's, it's about the relationship. Thanks, Tom. Noemi, how have you approached this? <laughs> um, a lot of the things that Tom said resonated with me and things that were mentioned earlier, because what I had said earlier was that we need to find ways to make it clear that we're listening, right? That we see them. And, and be genuine about it. And, and some of the ways in which we can do that, for instance, in the classroom, is having moments, checking moments, where you hear what's going on. What are their joys of the week, of the moment? Or what are things that are, have them worried? And you're not the only one who hears this, right? The peers also hear this. So you're creating community uh, among them because that's part of the belonging, experience of belonging, so that they feel that others are with them in their journey. Um, and so outside of the classroom, we also have ways to engage and, and, and have ways to, to hear and listen and get to know them. That's why your points were resonating with me. Um, some of the things I try to do is try to see them outside of the classroom. So can we do something where we meet for coffee uh, in the office or outside of the office uh, on campus? Or maybe we can go outside of campus. Uh, I've been fortunate that in the program I mentioned before, the CBRS program, there was some funding that allowed me to do some of that, those connections of you know, eating pizza with them. Um, so opportunities to hear them. I said earlier that when we hear them, then we have to really be listening so that if there's something we need to do about what we're hearing, we demonstrate that. And sometimes we may forget that they're struggling with something and, and move on with our requirements and our uh, expectations in the same way without making any uh, changes. So we need to be cognizant of that. So another way to, to demonstrate that we're hearing and seeing them is to now find ways to connect them to other things. Um, so Talisa was mentioning how important it was to have a mentor. So these moments, right, that you have is you hear them telling you something and you know a colleague you know someone else, or you know a resource or a program, uh, an office, um, something outside of campus that they can connect to that is related or relevant for them. That's our ways that um, you can help them see that they are heard, that they're seen, and that can bolster right, that sense of, of belonging. So little ways, I think Talisa, your point was so good, that there are so many moments in which we can do this, and it doesn't have to be a very uh, um, time consuming, relationship uh, with them. But if you do have the time for a time consuming relationship, that's great too. Because I think we can really connect more deeply, right, with students when we have that possibility of mentoring them and sort of following up with them on a on a regular basis. Um, so when I was saying that we hear and then see how we connect them to them to, to other opportunities, one way that I see that students also feel that the light is, is going off is when you find ways that they can showcase the great things that they're doing, the talents that they may have, their ideas. And so you know that there is perhaps a grant opportunity that they can apply to so that they can do a project with some funding and then be recognized for that. So you try to support them in things like that or support them in presenting in a conference 
AU is a great space for giving students opportunity to do things like that, presenting. And so showcasing what they do, I think it, it's so nice to see their faces when they get so excited that you thought that they could do that, that they are um, worthy of being heard in a space like that in a conference. And so I would encourage more of that, like you, we hear and then we do something about what we hear and we let them know that we are seeing them. Thank you. Great distinction. Um, hearing and listening, right? And also remembering, Noemi, I don't know if you're having this experience, but for me going back to face-to-face -to -face slowly, it's taken a minute to remember that going that extra gives back in spades to me, mm -hmm. right? I sort of, Not that I forgot it, like I know that, right? But but it has really, it's been a good muscle memory, right? That it does, it, ca it can become reciprocal, right? To ourselves as well. So, so those little things, um, and then when the student comes back and said, I got the internship and they're so excited and what, what, that reminds me at least of why I'm here, why I'm doing this instead of all the other, you know, things that we could be doing. So thank you for that reminder. So Brandon, you're in the law school. There's a lot of students in your classes. Um, how, how might you approach these, these kinds of questions? Yeah, I mean, I, I was really just, um, I, I'd reiterate what Noemi just said, seeing and hearing your students, I think is so important. Um, you asked about peer-to-peer -peer support is one of the, the questions. And um, I assume it's the same at other schools, at the law school, sort of coming through the pandemic. I've sensed a huge just thirst for students to engage with each other. Um, and I think that one of the, the silver linings of sort of Zoom school was breakout rooms. I used it quite a bit. Uh, and I've kept doing that now as I've come back into in-person uh, classes. You know, I use Socratic method, we do lecture, but I would give them time just to chat uh, and unmoderated. And I feel like that was actually kind of key to let them talk without me right there. It was a non-instrumental part of the class. They weren't being evaluated. It was literally just a chance for them to connect. Um, so I think that's something that was successful. You know, I'd play with the, the size of the, the breakout room or now in class. Uh, I give them discussion questions and I usually start with a well-being check, something like on a scale of one to a hundred, how are you managing the pandemic today? Or how are you managing midterms? Or what's something you're really looking forward to? What's something you're dreading this week? Um, and yeah, I, I think it, they've you know, enjoyed that. I try to take it personally that often on my student evaluations, the, the highlight for them is the thing that I wasn't uh, really directly involved with at all. As they say, you know, there were days I really liked coming to camp. I didn't feel like coming to campus, but I did because I appreciated the chance to, to connect with other students. So that's a small thing, um, but I think that's one. Uh, you asked about staff support. You know, at the law school, we have the Office of Student Affairs and they're great, led by our associate dean, David Jaffe, and they keep a close watch. We take attendance. I mean, I'm teaching two sections of property right now with almost 90 students in each section, and we take attendance. I'm tracking who's showing up to class, and if students stop showing up or if they start having issues or they're not turning in uh, their assignments on time, uh, I'll reach out to them, and then I'll, if, if I don't hear anything or if issues persist, I'll reach out to the dean, uh, associate dean of students. So that's a big role that, that staff plays. Um, and then as far as faculty goes, I, I just really, to, to Noemi's point, trying to listen and respond to their needs, um, and, and it's a balance because, you know, as Provost Starr said in the introduction, I've been thinking about this, you don't want to cater to every single need that they have, it's impossible, um, so there's a balance there, but, you know, as one example, I have a student right now, a really fantastic student who came through my property class, came through my housing law and policy class, and is really fired up about uh, wanting to have a new first year, you know, 1L as we call it, uh, course that sort of interrogates the 1L curriculum and looks at property law and torts and crim law and contracts through a more critical lens, looking at race and power and equities and all the ways we could be doing better with our curriculum. Uh, and there's support, there's a new ABA accreditation requirement that requires law schools to be taking more account of racism and bias, cultural competency, that sort of thing. So she's been working on this and the, the DEI committee on at the law school supports it. Uh, the one problem is there's no faculty member that is available to teach it. Um, and she's been sort of making the rounds and came to me and I had my package, you know, already sort of established. Uh, but I didn't want to let it go. And not just because of the importance of the material, uh, but mostly just her excitement and, and passion. And she's graduating. I mean, she's not really even going to directly necessarily benefit by this class. So 
we've worked out an independent study this semester where we're gonna go through readings together. We're gonna do some like beta testing with other students and see what people really wanna hear. Um, and then work up a course proposal together and, and work on, on getting it passed. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing is to the extent you have the capacity and bandwidth to hear and try to respond to what students are asking for. I think to the earlier question, you know, we're all balancing a lot ourselves. And if we're being honest, we're dealing with our own well-being challenges. Um, and I think that's actually one other way we can support students. And I know this is being talked about, but is by revealing a more realistic picture of ourselves to students that we too are dealing with anxiety and depression and some disillusionment around law and its role in society, um, you know, and, and letting them into that a little bit while we're also, of course, you know, teaching the duties of professionalism, uh, I think could be another way that we support students. Yeah, appreciate that. And also appreciate that turn to what does it mean for our pedagogy, right? How do we teach, right? So, so now we're going to turn and focus in a little more on teaching itself as a practice and a, a space and place to do some of that student engagement work. So um, Corbin, maybe you can kick us off, you know, how do you see good teaching playing a key role here? Um, and, and how could that how could that show up? So first of all, I'm so pleased in the ordering of these questions because one of the things that excites me so much is just hearing from my colleagues about the things that you're doing. It resonates so deeply with the research on great college teaching and what we know, the, the pedagogical practices that we know really do support student success, both in that class, but also in long-term retention. And you know what I heard just a second ago what I, was what I consider a humanizing approach to pedagogy. I heard about interactive approaches to pedagogy. I heard about student-centered and also approaches that connect to students' lived experiences, their lives, their cultures, right? All of those things we know from research matter to student success, both in that first course, but also in retention. Um, I, I uh, conducted a, I and, and my research team uh, conducted an observational study of more than 700 courses across nine different colleges and universities over 10 years. And um, one of the things that, thank you, <laughs> um, one of the things that we found um, that was really amazing is that across these universities, some were highly ranked, some were broad access. Um, they were two universities that stuck out as having what I would consider a teaching supportive culture. And, and we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. But even among those institutions that I would consider to have a teaching supportive culture, the proportion of courses that were enacting those student-centered pedagogies and especially those equity-based pedagogies. So when we're talking about culturally responsive pedagogy, when we're talking about anti-racist teaching, when we're talking about teaching that fosters a sense of belonging in the classroom, these are the kinds of pedagogies that actually improve outcomes for all students, but particularly for students of color and also students who come from low income backgrounds and first generation students. Those pedagogies, even in the most teaching supportive cultures, were happening in a minority of classes. So a majority of classes are missing opportunities to connect with students through pedagogy. And I feel like that is, that is so critical for us to take to heart. And I feel grateful to be in a place where we have inclusive pedagogy fellows, where we have so many resources at AU through CTRL and through others, you know, to, to, for, for folks, um, for our faculty to improve in those aspects of teaching. But I just wanna reinforce that those of you who are doing that humanizing work, you know, who are really connecting to that individual student who is really capable of holding the high expectations that we know are important for learning, but they had a circumstance that required extra flexibility, that required extra understanding. You know, those of you that are doing those kinds of pedagogies, you, first of all, unfortunately, are a little unusual in higher education spaces and should be deeply valued and rewarded for the work that you're doing, but yes. <laughs> Um, but also you really are making a difference. You're making a difference for all students, but also particularly the students that have not been students who have been deeply supported in higher education, have not had those individual faculty mentors and who really need your support the most. Thanks, Corbin. And that approach to pedagogy that you outlined, it doesn't mean all teaching has to look the same. 
right? We can come at it um, in different ways, right? So, so to Lisa, I'm curious, you know, how have you thought about pedagogy um, and your own teaching approach, um, especially with respect to some of the things that, that Corbin laid out? Yeah, so I will say I'm obviously the deviant on this panel, which is quite, quite in line with what I teach. So um, I don't, even though I agree, I clearly I'm not obviously going to argue with clear statistics, but I do not try to get to know my students personally, because in my class, they tend to either conspire or confess to crimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, berate the system, um, or in um, really sensitive um, circumstances, they'll even um, express and be transparent about moments of victimization. So, so that is not what I ever tend to do. Um, uh, it's just not, I don't believe in safe spaces. I believe in brave spaces and who am I to ask that of someone? So I don't, um, I, I don't try to get to know them as a person. I, I do try to get to know their brains though. One, because as a criminologist that's trained as a sociologist, I'm fascinated with the way people think. And sometimes what that looks like is if they don't, um, if they're having trouble articulating a point in class, I'll say, come on and draw it out right? Draw it on a whiteboard. Because some people work better better like that, right? Um, I'll give you five minutes and I'll come back to you, right? Um, another thing I do in the space is, again, I'm bad with names. So placards are mandatory, right? That's my attendance, everything. I love a placard, um, which is just a piece of construction paper. I know I am also a green teacher, though, everybody. Let's, let's be clear. I have my certificate. Anyway, ha! Huh. Let's not shade me. All right. And so, but I use placards for names, but on the <laughs> but on the inside, um, what happens is if they don't speak in class, they have the opportunity to tell me why they didn't contribute, right? They write inside of the placard notes to me. Right. Something else that I do though, I will um be transparent in this space is that my approach to teaching is to make everyone in incredibly uncomfortable. Um, that is where I think that the brain stretches the most. And again, the brain, I think, is my responsibility. Right? So um, I try to make everyone equally uncomfortable. And what that looks like and what that has looked like um, on this campus has been that when my Black students show up in a space and they think that I'm going to agree that cops are bad or et cetera, whatever, um, I challenge them on purpose. I disagree with them intentionally, and it makes us quite, it makes it quite uncomfortable. As a woman that has more melanin concentrated in her skin, I also often advocate in my class for what people would assume is a colorist standard, not because I believe in it, but because my job is to not affirm them in their space, but to challenge them. And that creates inclusion because when they leave AU and they go to doctoral programs that I wish I would have went to, right? When that happens, when they get they they email me and they said I was ready for theory because I took your class. That's the point, right? And so that's how I approach it in this space. I do want to say though that something I do, um, I do a couple things that probably would make you know people uncomfortable. But one of the things I want to um, bring up around race and racism because it's one of my areas is um, when I teach race, I'll say, so what is whiteness? But only people who identify as white can answer. Right. So I do silent students intentionally. Right. And you might think, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Right. But honestly, everyone should not answer all questions. Period. What is blackness? I dare somebody to get up and tell me that black what blackness is based on a stereotype that they've heard perpetuated by the media or from the small town that they've come from. And now this AU is the most diverse place they've ever been in their lives. And now they believe that they're expert in blackness because they're in front of a black scholar. And I've put that question on the floor. So just as important as, as it is, is to kind of create belonging. Belonging is also about protecting my students. And I have to do that, particularly the black and brown ones or the white ones, right? I have white students that have raised their hands in class and said, Dr. Carter, I want to be an ally, but I'm afraid that I'm too wealthy to be an ally. That's a real concern on this campus. I've answered that question in multiple classes, in multiple spaces. And it's not about telling people, giving people permission, because who am I, right? I just went to school for a long time and I'll probably die in school. Um, <laughs> Who am I, right? I don't have that kind of, <laughs> I don't have that kind of social capital, but what I do have is control of the space, right? And this is similar, and people hate when I say this, but it's similar to when I was a correctional officer, which of which I was one. But you, everyone wields authority different, but it's not only your job to make people feel belonging by allowing them to talk, but it's also about controlling the space. And you have to do that by one, sometimes it looks like some, every, 
every every class in the semester, I show up dressed in my CO clothes. One, because I don't have to wear heels, but two, because it does great things for student evaluations. Um, but when you show up, right, similar to what was said, what um, Brandon said about being your transparent self, when you show up in all aspects of your professionalism, Kogog probably, y'all probably do that all the time as CEOs and things. Um, but when you show up like that, but also when you cut people off and say, no, that's not right. All cops aren't this, right? No, that's not right. Correctional officers, not all correctionals do that, right? That Those are the moments that I'm talking about that they remember. So in my opinion, going back to that, what what our, what the role or my approach to pedagogy is, is one, to make people uncomfortable, two, to remember them, three, to get to know them, but get to know their brains, right, more than their person, because I can't, the deviance is just too high. Also, statistically, like, this is the time that they're acting out, right? That curve is for 18 to 24, this, this is the crime, <laughs> no. Um, and so you have to control the space with all the knowledge that we have, we have to control the space in a warm way, but it's not only about making them feel welcome, it's also making them feel protected. Thanks. Woo, yes, class to that. We all know whose classes we need to go observe now, right? Um, all right, thank you. <laughs> you're gonna protect it. You're gonna protect yourself from all of us, aren't you? I know, okay. Brandon, close us out. How do you, how do you think about this? Man, I'm up here taking notes. I don't know. That that is hard to follow. Um, yeah. So uh, some of the things I do to try to uh, you know work on student engagement and, and approach my approach to the classroom, I would say my number one thing, and I was taught this as a teaching fellow, is show them that you care first. So and that if you show them that you care about them and about their learning, they will learn so much better. I feel like that has proven true many many times in the classes I've taught. Uh, similarly, I tried to sort of model for them excitement about the subject. So like I said, I just started teaching this week property and I always start by saying, I love property law so much. Here's some reasons why it's concrete and yet abstract and on and on. Uh, and I hope by the end of the semester, you will too. And similarly throughout the semester, I try to say things that sort of demonstrate excitement about the material. Like, oh my gosh, can you imagine a low income housing tax credit case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court, you know, incredible housing nerds like us were so excited, uh, trying to like trick them into getting excited about that. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, my own take, I think tone in class is important. We do a works in progress session where we all, they write papers and we do sort of collective feedback. And I remind them of the things we learned in grade school, you know, start with something that you appreciated about the paper. When you're giving critique, be very specific, give constructive criticism. Um, I think truthfully, I've wrestled with the tone issue a little bit in class. Uh, early on, some of the feedback I got was that I need to be more clear with students when they've got something wrong and, and maybe make students a little more uncomfortable. You know, I mean, in class yesterday, now this case is in Illinois, it's not in Louisiana, um, and be very clear so that, you know, while we're being compassionate and, and responsive, we're also willing to, to tell students when they're getting something wrong. Um, while also maybe being validating. I see why it is that you thought that. Um, I try to make the material relevant to their lives. Another sort of pandemic canvas era thing that I've kept is a discussion board where I ask students to post articles that connect with the themes of the course, but in the news topics they're seeing right now. And in addition to making, you know, 1600s property law feel more relevant because they start to see it all around the place. It lets me give a little shout out, you know, sort of sneakily at the beginning of class. Oh, thanks, you know, Kimley for posting this article. And and I think sometimes they respond to that. Uh, I'm sure many of you do this thing, which is the sort of anonymous mid-semester feedback form, uh, which I've found helpful, uh, not necessarily because there's always a consensus around what students think about the class. Some want more discussion, some want less. Uh, but just going over it with them in class gives some sort of accountability and sense of them being heard, which I think, Noemi, you were talking a lot about. Uh, I think that's a big, big theme is trying to make sure they feel like their voice is is uh, present in class. They have ownership over the class. Um, I have them help facilitate chapters of this book, The Color of Law, many of you probably read, that we read in the course. For the research papers, they pick the topic. So, you know, a, a piece of the class where we're talking about topics that they've all selected. Uh, I try to avoid anyone uh, being singled out as the sole voice in the course about race or gender or sexual orientation. Sexual orientation. Uh, it's something I really sort of try to, to make clear in class. Uh, student pronouns. 
Uh, I've botched this before. I have sort of endless faith in Gen Z, and one reason for that is I, I once botched a student's pronouns, and a really sweet student came up afterwards and gently reminded me. So I think, you know, to all the things we're doing, our students are incredible actors and also helping to create the sort of environment that we want. Uh, I encourage students not to take part in the kind of wholesale transformation of their personalities and identities that sometimes happens in professional school. And there's sort of this mode, you show up as like this happy graduated law student, and then you come out and you're wearing suits and you're working at a big law firm. Uh, I encourage them, no, hold on to the values and principles that you had when you came here while you're learning to argue, you know, all sides of a case, hold on to the networks, the, the you know, text a family member, a friend, someone else who's in your support system, start to think of me and your other faculty members as part of that support system. So those are the, some of the, some of the things I do. It's a work in progress. I really like teaching because it feels sort of like being a scientist, iterating every semester what worked, what didn't work, and trying new things. And obviously, this conference is incredible. Uh, you know, I'm going to leave with a whole new set of things to try. So, thank you. And you all have laid out so many different ways to build that sense of connection, right? You've talked about interpersonal connections to students. You've also talked about connections to the field connections to the content of the course, connections to themselves as learners, right? These are all really authentic ways to build that connection and sense of belonging that allow for a range of approaches in the classroom, right? So, so know that you can find yourself in your teaching or your mentoring or your educative practice for the staff out there in lots of different ways that are authentic to you but are committed to the kind of principles that we're laying out here, right? With the same end goal in mind, right? So. So I'm gonna close out, Kehoe's giving me the eye here, um, the wink. Um, I'm gonna close out with the last question and, and, and I'll ask it of our first four panelists and, and ask you to, to be sort of as succinct as you can here. But you all are doing this work. We know we have many colleagues doing this work, but to Corbin's point on the data, it's tough to get this at scale, right? It's tough to do this at scale. So what institutional supports and resources are needed here at AU, and we're going to be taking notes, right, to make sure that faculty and staff are enabled um, to build the sense of belonging in a way that actually is expansive and reaches all of our students. So maybe we'll just go down the row here. Final thoughts, um, Noemi. Well, one thought I have, and maybe this is coming as a term faculty member, and I see many of us here in the audience, um, it speaks to something Corbin said earlier, and that is how is this valued at the university? And so we know we enjoy, many of us really enjoy doing this, these connections, taking this time. Um, so it would be fantastic to bring this to scale if this could be seen as part of what is valued in our work when we're thinking of promotions or reappointments, et cetera. And so that it's not like a hobby on the side. This is integral to what we do. And so when we write those uh, narratives for how we're doing our work, this is also considered as part of that. That would be my, my one uh, suggestion. Um, so I know Koga tried to start a mentoring program uh, in the middle of COVID and I'm a huge advocate of that. Um, I mean, my vision is while we have the uh, the robes on and we're coming in and the bagpipes are playing at graduation, uh, the parents are taking pictures, I would like to have a student to the right of me and the student to the left of me um, who I have mentored for many years, help them get a job. Um, and I, I think the um, graduate education program, some, some, some graduate program does that. I, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, it's like when your kids are in high school, they're a seventh grader and they give them a 12th grader uh, as sort of the buddy system. Um, so a, a buddy who could be a student, a buddy who could be a professor, uh, both. I, I think those are good ideas. Um, and also, you know, I guess I've, I've um, especially during Zoom, like I would say if you can help it, like don't lecture in your class, um, you know, try to use the Socratic method, try to create a conversation. I mean, I don't like the sound of my own voice voice so much, you know, and I can tell after about six minutes and 22 seconds, they don't either. Um, so like, you know, just a conversation. And um, you were saying uh, earlier, Brennan, uh, you know, small groups, uh, team exercises in class, breaking it up, making it fun. 
Um, I would say those two things. I'm so glad that this uh, question is um, is wrapping us up because it is so critical, right? The, the broader supports to do this work could not be more important to ensuring retention on a community level and not on in, in individual classes, right? And I'm sorry, I'm gonna do a quick shameless plug. Um, I have a, a book that's in pre-sale right now <laughs> called <laughs> Great College Teaching. Uh, where it happens and how to foster it everywhere. And the book focuses on institutional, um, collegial, and individual level supports for teaching, teaching improvement. And one of the things I want to share from this book is that so much of teaching improvement efforts across the nation, especially when we talk about equity-based teaching, focuses on the individual level of faculty improvement, right? How do we get this individual faculty to improve? This is the same problem that we that President Burwell was just discussing about our retention efforts, right? How do we, the individual level matters, but also the normative level matters, the cultural level matters, and the reward structures, the policy level matters. We know that there are so many structures in place that are important to teaching improvement. And we need to have departments that are talking about teaching and not just any teaching, but equity-based teaching. We need to have policies, practices, and norms that are happening at the department and the institutional level to support teaching engage engagement across our faculty. And if you're interested in the book, there's a flyer at this table. <laughs> I think my one thing is that we need to be so backed, like back me up here, right? So it's one thing to train us, which this is awesome, community, great. But when I'm alone in a classroom with 24, 25 students, and I'm saying, nope, mm -mm, try again. Right. And then one complaint, one complaint can shake my world for the entire semester. One complaint can make me so scared to be to show up as my true self in the classroom. One complaint can ruin two weeks of my life and I'm going to call my mother. Right. One student complaint can do that. And we, it has to be established that especially if, if we're, we've been trained, if the by and large there are no we need to be backed when we make moves in class and that is what i would argue that particularly in um structurally vulnerable situations if you haven't yet achieved tenure or maybe tenure is not even in the path that you're on you need to be backed and so it requires paperwork paper trails folders like i do all that stuff because student evaluations i've been called out of my name i've been introduced by my skin color right i've been all these things have happened i've been people talk about my all outfit more than they talk about my degrees like all that stuff happens and we know it happens we have literature that it happens ctrl has a website where you can go and pull the literature that it happens and that's all great but it doesn't mean anything if one student voice ripples and shakes the foundations of my life for months on end thank you appreciate it and brandon yeah you have a last thought uh this is the one question i didn't brief so this is a. Uh, okay let's go spontaneous I'll just, I'll just end by saying let's keep doing this learning from each other in non-transactional ways and what an incredible legacy and farron to you to have brought us together for this now for 34 years so thank you so much well done nice closing thank you Okay, so now we're going to take some questions. Um, those of you in the audience, we also have folks on Zoom. Kiho, do you do you want me to call on folks? And then whoever's moderating Zoom, also please let me know when it's when it's time to pull comments from our audience. Um, yes, would you please say your name yeah, as hi. well? And Ralph then... Sonnenschein, uh, teach uh, economics. Um, this is from uh, Thomas, right? Uh, from... Yep, yep. Um, and anybody, but I, if I heard you right, you said the number one reason that re, um, we lose students retention-wise is ROI. Did I hear that right? Um, it was curious when I heard that because students aren't paying either, in, you know, directly or if they are paying, you know, through loan, they don't really know what they're paying. So you don't know the cost. You can't do an ROI. So I'm asking, what are they really saying? Because you can't improve retention if you don't know what they're really saying. Are they saying it's not prestigious enough a school? If it's Harvard, I would pay, we'd pay that. But if it's not, I don't know. I just wanted to hear your comment on that. And I think Corbin's going to have a follow-up on this. But um, at least in COGAD, um, and I would assume the average student knows how much, how expensive the school is. Um, you know, if it starts with a seven or an eight, which most schools do these days, unfortunately, 
everybody knows that's a big number, uh, though a lot of kids are on uh, financial aid. But um, a lot of, according to Casey Evans, our dean of undergraduate, she says that a lot of students end up uh, transferring to state schools and even junior colleges for cost reasons. And so it's like, wow, I'm paying $80,000. Am I getting $80,000 worth of whatever here? Um, and in, in many cases, the answer is no. And I just wanted to add, and, and actually, I'm not the expert on this, and we do have Provost Starr in the audience. So I will say, um, I, it's my understanding that that, that that isn't the number one reason across the whole university that the number my and again this is just repeating what i believe i heard so if i'm wrong please jump in um my my understanding is that when we aggregate across the university the number one reason is sense of community and so that um i just wanted to draw that out because it's tied so nicely i think to the conversation on this panel um but also it does connect to roi right because it connects to our identity as an as a university right who who is au what how do we feel a deeply connected sense to american university as a whole this connects to president burwell's conversation as well right that that i feel connected not just to one person but to a you as an institution um so i just wanted to add that um dynamic and let me invite president burwell or, or provost star do y'all want to weigh in I think it's a really important question, and I think one of the things to understand about our, our students is that there is not a student, and that as we think about the population, just as we think about our faculty and our staff and everything, that, um, and this happened, and we know when we ask surveys, somebody said, you know, you get all the different answers. It's just even going over the fact that you get all the different answers, and so as we think about it, if you ask me to answer the question one, and, and Peter will come and join it, I'm sure, too, but if you ask me the one, it would be that the value proposition isn't worth it. And so for some students, the value proposition has to do with they don't get enough financial aid. For another student, you're a full pay student and you don't feel the value either academically in the classroom or you don't feel the value because you know what you wanna do. You came here to do, uh, you know, you came here to do this and you know what you want to do, and you're not getting enough of that. And so it varies student to student, but there are a set of buckets. But if you ask for the one thing, it's the value proposition, but the value proposition falls into a number of categories. Sometimes it's about money. Sometimes it's about connectivity in terms of the kinds of things we're talking about, sense of belonging. Are you with your peeps? Do you have a community that you love? Um, sometimes it's connection in the form of, do you have somebody that cares for you? A lot of what we've talked about. Sometimes it actually is in the form of, um, are the academics right for you? Up or down, you know, that could be at a number of different levels. So it, if you want to put it in one, it's one bucket, but then it separates into pieces. And the other thing that's extremely important as we do this work, and I'm sure Peter may say something about this too, is it is different school by school. And that has a lot of different elements to it. And so it is actually has to be has to be thought about at the school basis. I mean, we know our College of Arts for SPA and SIS, people come here. These are this is like the people that come here are usually quite intentional that this is what they want and they know. Others have different paths. So their academic pathways are better, are clearer for some than others. And that creates different issues. So Hope that's helpful a little bit, but Peter, let me turn to you. Ralph, thank you for the question. It's an incredibly important question. And I think Corbin and Sylvia really have answered it, that it is about uh, it is about ROI and value proposition, but that social fit, that feeling of being in a community that supports you is among the things that our students who indicate a propensity to leave in the fall and summer transition surveys 70% of the people who indicate a percent, an intention to leave, it doesn't mean they're gonna leave, many of them stay. 70% of them say social fit, 40% of them say academic fit. So academic fit is an issue thing. We don't have nursing, we don't have engineering. It's a whole raft of students who leave for that reason. But the reason why Sylvia and Amanda and me and everyone is talking about community is because finding their people is the challenge that a lot of our students are facing these days. And obviously the pandemic has exacerbated it. So you will hear, and, and there are probably people in this room who will have said, 
our students leave to go to Georgetown or our students leave to go to Cornell or our students leave to go to NYU. And there are a few, there are a few. Last fall, we had a lot more of them because there had been a less tra transfer up the food chain as it were uh, the previous year. But generally that's not why our students leave. Uh, it's absolutely true that most many of our students leave for community colleges, for local flagship state schools. Um, and so, it, it, but ROI is not just, you know, what kind of job you get at the other end. ROI is also how this university makes you feel, how you feel yourself in the community, how you as an individual find your way in the community. And that's what's so important for all of us and why this panel is so perfect for this, this session. Hi. I am Natasha Coco Benitez. This will be my first time teaching at AU. I went to graduate school here. Welcome, be, yay. So exciting. I'm gonna be teaching strategies in stress management. So, so much of what each of you hit come on. Come back, just please like, come ah. back. And ironically, I'm a little stressed making my syllabus. So I got a question for you. Something I've really been thinking about, and I love that y'all have hit on this, keeping it conversational, because that is so my style, but it's kind of in connection to this question of value. But what I'm struggling with is, if my syllabi or the way I teach class, if it's too lax, if it feels too, too conversational or too talk about yourself, are my students feeling like they're getting their value? This is really something I'm struggling with. So I know how I learn. I know how I teach adults. I know how I want to be as a teacher. I know what I want them to feel every day they walk out of my class. But creating this syllabus has been such a struggle. And I've, I got hired for this back in like late October. So I've had some time. <laughs> and now I'm coming here to y'all and I'm asking for a cup and AU's pouring me a waterfall of resources. So I'm actually feeling a little more overwhelmed. So I'm over here breathing and grounding and doing all the stuff that I do. But my question to all of, if, if anybody can chime in, if you had to give me your top three takeaways that for me to think about as a new professor, creating my syllabus for a strategies and stress management class, like what, Maybe not the content specific, but what are your three things that work for you? Maybe I'm overthinking something that has proven the most beneficial for your students, maybe in your evals that has proven the most, they've come back years later and told you about something that you may not have thought about was a big deal, but it totally was to them. Just help me out. Three things. I got to narrow this on down. <laughs> Thank Fantastic you Fantastic questions. Yes. Let me turn to my colleagues. Three things, or maybe one, if you've got one and you can get sort three or three. So I'm happy to chime in and allow some others time to think um, <laughs> that because it's a tough, you know, it's it's tough to drill it down, right? It really is. But one of the things you just raised and actually was raised a little earlier on the panel that um, that I feel like I want to name is that often I have heard rigor positioned as opposed to equity, right? Like we can either be rig rigorous or we can be equity based. But what I think is really important, right, is that equity-based work, and, and Celissa, you were, you were talking about this, is cognitively complex and engaging work, right? Now, so, so what that means to me is like, I could be dressed down potentially and do like rigorously engaging cognitive work around my subject matter in a way that connects to their lived experiences, right? Now, I also have to say there's some there's some identity politics around who can dress down and who cannot dress down. So that's I think also critical. No worries. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so so we need to be mindful of that, right? Um, but but this idea that in order to be equity based, I need to drop my standards. Actually, that that's that's against what we know about this the the work on the foundational level, right? If we read Gloria Latson Billings' work, right, for example, which is like foundational, foundational around culturally relevant teaching, you know, what she says is that an aspect of culturally relevant teaching is ensuring that students succeed, right? And that success is about them, like holding those high standards, believing that they have the ability to succeed in complex contexts of thinking, right? And I think that's some of what we heard here. But but I just I wanted to name that if you're ever in a space as a teacher, and you're questioning, like, should I go with rigor? Or should I go with equity? we know that there's something wrong with the, the uh, bifurcation of that, right? And that's a time to use that normative and cultural level to bring it to a, a colleague that's trusted, right? That, that you believe is doing this kind of work to say, okay, I sort of see two options here. Help me think of a third, right? 
where I can hold that rigor that I know is so important to their learning and do it in an equity minded way. Yeah, I'll quickly say, one kudos to you for really thinking through your syllabus, spending the time on it. Don't shame yourself, right? Just let that let that go. Shake that off. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Shake that off. Also, in your okay, all right, Jesus. That was also, a mic drop moment. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> also, you know, in your body, I do want you to be mindful of the space that you're in, right? And so, um, I cannot relate to you at all about having a relaxed class because I don't feel safe enough in my body to do that right? My class is not relaxed. However, it is discussion heavy. And I do intentionally create assignments that challenge them. So for example, my grad level theory course I'm teaching, the midterm is a comp, old school comp. You sit in a room and you write these essays with no, you know, this old school comp. But before I give each comp out, or before I, when I give my syllabus, I tell them how to skim. I show them how to skim. I bring my comp notes when I took comps and I showed them how to take comp notes, right? So it's one thing to introduce rigor, but it's another thing to leave them to their own devices to figure it out, right? And so I never, I never, I've, I have never compromised on what I believe a theory course should be, despite the fact there's 26 people in it, 30 page papers, times 48 hours to grade them at the end of the semester, but right? So you're setting yourself up for a thing, but I don't want you to think that discussion necessarily means lax because it, do it doesn't. And also you can write a mean syllabus. You just need the one thing I want everybody to know, but particularly you, is that you have to grade all of this stuff. And at the end of the semester, <laughs> and at the end of the semester, we got 48 hours to turn grades in and that's no joke. So that's the main thing I think about when I make my syllabus is those 48 hours. But it's, but discussion, <laughs> Discussion is not, <laughs> discussion does not mean that you cannot have a real like part for assignment as long as you're giving them the tools to manage stress. So my, my suggestion, what I would do is I would stress them out and then teach them how to handle it, right? <laughs> that's how I would approach that, but that's my approach. Uh, I just jump in to say, I really appreciate the question, Natasha, the vulnerability of wrestling with the syllabus. And I'm sitting up here thinking about, you know, how I do this and what other people are saying. The thing that comes to mind for me is that teaching, in my experience, having taught, say, a housing law seminar, it's really not a linear experience, right? There's like different segments of the, of the emotional experience, the relationship with the students. And so for me, I start with like hard data in Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies, and we look at the hard data. And then we spend some time, you know, doing, like mentioned earlier, low-income housing tax credits and calculating basis. And I think this is just the way I've approached it. There is a moment where I feel like I'm kind of trying to build up credibility that then when I want to talk about how we feel about homelessness and how we feel about policy issues, there's always in the background, you know, this isn't like a warm and fuzzy class that is talking about this because we can't also talk about drier, you know, mechanical things. It's because it's equally important. But I don't know that for some reason that's helped me when you feel like you've sort of built up some credibility to move into that phase. And then we do the discussion groups. And by the end of the class, when I'm opening it up to their conversation about their papers, it almost feels like the rain slowly throughout the semester giving more to them. So just one piece of advice is in doing your syllabus, maybe don't think about it as just this like linear experience. How do you know climbing this mountain? What do you see as the different moments and where you're trying to start and where you get from? So that's how I think about it. And to follow on with that, you're not going to get it right the first year, maybe by the fifth or sixth or seventh year, start feeling comfortable with it. Um, but I uh, half joke to myself that I'm half game show host up there. You know, you got to keep people entertained. And, um, you know, I do think of uh, Sesame Street, you know, they, they, they are um, having fun and they don't actually know they're learning. It's, it's got to be fun, I think. It's got to be stimulating. Um, imagine the kid with the worst attention span possible. Put put that have that person in mind. W when would they start getting bored? Um, I mean, my I've told my students this. My ideal class is every single one of you is going to talk in class every single class. Um, but if you can just imagine one person standing up there talking, it's not going to go so well for anybody, no matter how good a speaker you are. Um, so, and a, a combination of, um, materials, you know, a little textbook, maybe case studies in class conversations and in class groups, just, you know, mix it up, um, and, and you'll get it right over time.
So let me repeat this for Zoom. You're sort of saying, do you ever adapt your syllabus, um, you know, as you move through the class? I think the answer categorically is yes. Um, you can also not adapt your syllabus. You can adapt your practice and your approach, right? So there are different ways to do it, um, but you should. <laughs> you should respond. That's culturally responsive instruction, which is what you know, you've heard. Responding as you get to know and you build the culture of your class, right? Your unique culture of your class, you must respond to that. So know that, right? That's part of the, the, the grace you give yourself is pedagogy is a practice. It's right, just like any other, I don't know if you do yoga, other wellness things, it's a practice, right? And so it will, it will come. So let me turn and go to CTRL yeah, for lots of reasons. Thank you. We have a question in the back. How y'all doing today? Uh, my name is Kevin Medina. Um, I'm one of the directors of undergraduate admissions. So coming from a little bit of a different world, um, also new to AU. So welcome. Thank <laughs> so thank you all for this. Um, but I did have a question in terms of um, what you're seeing in the classroom. Um, and if you're seeing any um, Comparative, comparatively speaking, in regards to the pandemic or any trends you're seeing in, again, comparatively to your older students who may have had their pandemic experience be in college or, you know, even those that are at the graduate level compared to your younger, maybe freshmen who that formative experience in terms of the pandemic really happened during high school. If you've seen any trends or if you've seen any things of note for those, because again, this is really the, the only time where we are going to have that kind of juxtaposition between both of those groups as this group, you know, these groups of students leave soon, we will only have students that had it during high school, if that makes sense. Great question. Well, I'm going to um, bring here uh, an activity I saw in Dr. DeCour's class uh, last semester that really shows what's happening with students. What was that experience like? In fact, I would like to ask Dr. DeCour to, to please share with us. Um, it was a beautiful activity where your students share all the things that were severed because of COVID and, and where they are now and how they're feeling. And so I think we have a fabulous colleague here who could speak to, to some of that. Thank you, Dr. DeCour. That's so kind of you. Thank you, Noemi. Um, in our CBRS, complex problems course, I had a group of students that did a beautiful visual activity. So imagine a spool of yarn and imagine it already cut in like three, four feet lengths. And imagine people standing at a circle. One person is in the middle holding all the pieces of yarn and then everybody around the perimeter <coughs> circumference is holding the other end of the yarn. And one piece of yarn was called teacher-student relationships. Another piece of yarn was labeled after school activities. Another piece of yarn was labeled athletic events. Another piece of yarn might have been labeled healthy parents. Um, and then another student came around with a very large pair of scissors and cut every single one of those pieces of yarn, except I think the teacher student relationship yarn and showed visually in a very powerful way how COVID has disrupted their school experiences in kindergarten through 12th grade in a way that no one, no one had words. It was just deeply powerful yarn, index cards, and a piece of, and a pair of scissors. Thank you, Noemi. Thank you for doing that. So I've noticed differences, but the differences I've noticed to be to be blunt doesn't change my expectations of the student. So um, I'm not discounting them. Um, and there's different ways that, you know, perhaps, and this is relates to things that my co-panelists have said. I think it's different when we put on a syllabus like, oh, writing center, but do you do does Dr. Carter know anybody's name in the writing center to send them to? Right. Um, you know, I've had a student, I actually had a student who was working on me um, with me on a grant and she was here in the spring, didn't think she could afford fall. I kept her on the grant because I needed her. So I then I hired her as a, a as an irregular employee and now she's back in the spring. Right. And she so she came back to us. She's she starts back again this spring. 
And she's been emailing me all the time that it's so hard because we think it's awesome. Hybrid, no campus, don't have to pay for gas, don't have to pay for the car, no commute. But she's floundering because nobody's here in the offices that she needs. She fits, you know, face to face. And I keep on saying, you know, giving her suggestions. You have to answer those emails. So it, I found myself in different ways. Or for example, I know the name of the person, Calvin Haney, who's over AU's food pantry. Do we know these people's names, right? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, we're doing a disservice one, thinking that students will get everything from, from us. A mentor is not a guru, right? So it's a network of mentorship that's gonna sustain people. But also if we as faculty don't know anybody on the other side of the house, which is what I call it. If you don't know anybody's name, then that's on you, right? You're falling short. It's our job to network, right? That's what business is. So yeah, I noticed that there are differences, differences in the way they, ways they need support. But again, I think that if you just strive to be kind of a well-rounded um, faculty person that those kind of things work themselves out. But the differences I've noticed in age or tenure or educational experience don't change my expectations of the student. Can I lean in on one thing you just said, Talisa, which I think is so important. Remembering these threads, there's faculty staff relations, right? This is a key partnership at this institution that we have to strengthen. Um, our staff are incredible, right? In lots of different ways and spaces. And can I get claps for our staff out there, please, too? Thank you. We're in a partnership, right? And so to Talisa's point, recognizing that and recognizing how that can help support our students and that's incumbent upon us in all the ways right to be in that sort of relationship um, but that it's harder to do after COVID because folks have turned over things have changed we have not we're not running into each other here and there in the way that we used to so to be intentional about building those relationships is really key one more question Kiho tells me anything on zoom that that we might want to Make sure we pay attention to for our colleagues who are here with us virtually. Okay. All right, thanks. I have, oh, question, I got a, no, question in the back. Hi, I'm Jeff Middens. Uh, I'm in literature and CAS, but I'm also the interim director of the uh, EU Honors Program. I want to re-highlight what you just said um, and put it back to uh, what Corbin and Talisa were actually talking about with community. Um, because there's a way in which we talk about the students and their commute sense of community, and they leave in four years. Um, AU as a community is actually uh, part of what the students feel and part of what the students build upon is us as faculty and staff. Um, and there is a deep problem um, that I have felt, I have been here 20 years um, and I am feeling gaps. Uh, I do think that there is still an issue between the schools that is uh, that we don't talk to each other enough, that sometimes uh, we only see each other at this particular time uh, amongst each other. I strive to work. I'm, I'm working with honors now because I want to work interdisciplinarily, and I want those particular kind of connections. But that sense of community. Earlier, we were talking about retention in my uh, morning seminar, and the question was deliberately asked with me. If you know, a whole bunch of people, administrators and faculty and boards of trustees, you know, is were in the room, what would you tell them? So <laughs> that's why I raised my hand here. And it's actually what Talisa said, I want to be backed up for this. We need the support, but our staff need the support also uh, to know that what we have is valuable and we need to learn the value from each other uh, and really search that out. That is our job as faculty to actually, you know, to reach out to other faculty and reach out to staff to find them and to make our community. So I think that's a wonderful place to close and just let's remind ourselves belonging is not something that just happens. We have to be intentional and build it right? We have to make it happen in, in all the ways. So let's say thank you to this incredible panel and to this audience for a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much.